They were code-like. They sounded electronic or mechanical. They caused uh, the car to vibrate and for this uh, tingling sensation to pass through Betty's and Barney's bodies. And at that point, they started to lose conscious awareness of time and of um, the terrain that they were passing through. They didn't speak to each other again for about 30 to 35 miles. And what brought them back to full consciousness and caused them to start talking again was a second series of beeping or buzzing sounds just like the first. The dog stood up on the back seat of the car and and looked out the rear window. Her ears perked up. Betty uh, asked Barney if, if he thought that the craft was around again, uh, if he even believed that flying saucers were real now. He had been a skeptic before that. And he replied, oh, Betty, don't be ridiculous. Of course not. Uh, he didn't want to admit to what he actually observed, although he did admit it the day that he arrived home. Uh, he was just becoming rather irritated about all of this. Uh, so I heard about all of these things, and over time I heard that there was a period of lost time, of missing time that Betty and Barney couldn't account for, and that I knew that Barney uh, had had sort of a mental block after he had observed these non-human entities on board the craft. Uh, The mental block was about their facial features. He knew that they were non-human, but there was something that he couldn't quite put together uh, to describe them, even though he said that one of them looked over his shoulder. Uh, He thought that he had smiled from, from a distance as Barney viewed him through binoculars. He had seen these beings uh, from the tops of their heads uh, almost down to their feet. He had noticed that they had very spindly legs. That was one thing that he had mentioned. Um, But he and Betty were both perplexed by this apparent period of amnesia. And they started to drive to the White Mountains. They'd take weekend trips trying to jog their memories about what had happened during this period of missing time. They recalled that they had observed a fiery orb on the road silhouetted against some trees. Uh, They recalled uh, encountering a roadblock somewhere along the route, but they didn't know where or when it occurred. What did your mom say to them when they're telling the story? You're there with your mom. What did your mom say to Betty and Barney? My mom was talking to Betty on the phone. uh, And that is when she had the, the conversation with Betty about her concern about contamination. And Betty was also concerned. This was a very close encounter with this craft, it hovered only 100 to 200 feet above Betty and Barney. So they were very much worried about radiation or other forms of contamination. And so my mother uh, told Betty that she would speak to our neighbor, who was a physicist, uh, about this and ask his opinion. And it is he who suggested that they take the compass out to the car Uh, And she also spoke to uh, my father's friend, who was a former chief chief of police of Newton, New Hampshire, and he recommended that they make a formal report to Pease Air Force Base. Here comes Project Blue Book. But before we get there, what did your dad say to all this? My dad was amazed and very, very interested in all of this. On the day that we went to Betty's and Barney's house, uh, he sat in the living room talking quietly to Barney. 
And Barney described the non-human entities that he saw on board the craft as much as he could remember. He described his experience to my father. And my father was quite impressed by Barney's memory for these details. My father claims that he was the one who suggested that Betty and Barney find a good psychiatrist who used hypnosis to try to uh, assist Barney in recalling whatever it was that he couldn't recall. So uh, that was about my father's assessment of all of it. He was very interested. Was your mom more concerned than interested? Uh, I think she was both concerned and interested. Do you think she ever thought that her sister was nuts? Absolutely not. Okay, that's good. <laughs> not at all. My my Aunt Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. My family was well-known and, and respected in that area. Um, Betty and Barney were both active in their church. They were... Uh, civil rights leaders in New Hampshire. Um, so, no, my, my mother didn't for a moment think that Betty was nuts. In addition to that, I found out that in 1957, my mother had had her own UFO sighting, but had never mentioned it to me. Can you talk about it for a moment? Yes, I can. Uh, she always went grocery shopping on Friday evenings. And this particular Friday night, she was uh, on her way from Kingston, New Hampshire, to Haverhill, Massachusetts, when uh, she saw a, a large, uh, sort of a mothership, probably, uh, hovering over a field. She stopped the car and watched this, and then she ran to a house nearby. And the people who lived in that house went out as well, and they all watched smaller disks flying out of this larger craft and then eventually flying back into it. So uh, this was uh, quite impressive news to me back then. So my mother knew that UFOs were real, um, and that would give her further reason to think that, that Betty was not nuts. How extraordinary, though, for her to have seen that, and then when her sister and her sister's husband goes through this experience, to have at least had a frame of reference for being able to listen to it. Yes. Yeah. Now, at the time that you're 13, you're hearing all this going on. Do you accept it? Yes, I did. Um, I had uh, a lot of admiration for my aunt, uh, who was uh, one of the better educated people in the family, uh, a high achiever, and I always wanted to be like her. Uh, I thought that maybe I wanted to be a social worker for the state of New Hampshire as well. And uh, so uh, I was very interested and intrigued and anxious to learn all that I could about this experience. But I was sworn to secrecy at the same time. Why? No one was ever to learn about this because of the public's perception about UFOs. And Betty and Barney had a lot to lose. They wanted all of this information to remain confidential. They would talk to family members about it, to a few close friends, to scientists and to UFO investigators, but it only became public through a violation of confidentiality in October of 1965. Which disrupted their entire lives, right? It absolutely did, yes. The sworn to secrecy part and doing the best they could to keep it private also gives time to maybe process what happened as well, right? Yes, it did give them and, and the family as well time to process it. Uh, I think that I had a little bit of emotional impact uh, from the whole thing because I found myself writing stories about it and thinking about what might have happened. So 
uh, I became quite a good young writer <laughs> privately 